Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the subject of today's webinar is machine health monitoring batteryless sensors, premiering a new product today. Uh, so we're going to take a little time to go through that and, uh, and kind of go through our company as well. Exciting day for us here to uh, formally introduce this to you all. Thanks for making the time to be here with us. Our agenda for today, uh, we'll do our introductions, talk a little bit about our company in general. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into that product, that new product today. We have new hardware here in the room too, so I'll switch on some video and, and show it to you guys in person. Uh, we'll just kind of talk through the solution itself. And then next steps, how we get this into your environment uh, and uh, help you guys transform your environments to pervasive sensing for all your, your motors, pumps, fans, rotating and vibrating equipment. Um, we do have Q&A here as part of the Zoom meeting. So if you look inside your uh, Zoom toolbar there, you'll see a Q&A box. Feel free to type any questions in you have as we go along. Since this is a webinar and there are a bunch of attendees, we're not gonna uh, stop for every question during the presentation, but we've reserved time at the end to make sure we get those addressed. Uh, so please go ahead and, and drop those in as you go through. Okay, first off, introductions. Uh, my name is Peter Woodman. I'm the technical sales lead here, a sales engineer for EverActive. Uh, I'm a lucky guy. I got into this company before we launched our first product. It's been uh, really fun for me to watch all of our products, but specifically this one evolved from just an idea, something that you can hold in your hand. So super excited to share that with you guys today. Uh, my co-presenter is one of EverActive's subject matter experts in motors and machines, Tom Ross. Hi, Tom. Hey, Peter. Good morning and good morning to everyone. I am recently with EverActive, about six or seven months now. It's been an exciting ride as we launch this product. And I come to EverActive with uh, 25 plus years of uh, um, a variety of reliability and maintenance experience. Awesome. So glad to have you on the team, Tom. And yeah, as Tom said there, good morning. He's uh, working out of the West Coast. Uh, Tom works out of our California headquarters in Santa Clara. I work out of the Midwest in our Michigan office in Ann Arbor. Uh, so it's the afternoon for me. Uh, but as you can see uh, here in these photos, Tom and I are usually most comfortable out in the field in our customer environments. We're outdoor cats, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, typically we'd want to premiere a product like this at a trade show or bring them directly to a customer site. Given what's been going on with coronavirus, I think we all have kind of a different understanding of, uh, you know, what the new normal is around process digitization. Uh, so, you know, we, some of our customers have been thinking about this for a long time, digitally transforming how they do business. For those who haven't uh, and have been putting it off, uh, now more than ever, I think people are sitting up and thinking about how, how they can you know, live through this unique moment in history and find solutions that allow them to be more efficient or have a better understanding of their physical assets remotely. Uh, just to cut down on the, you know, the routes that people are running or people having to be there in person uh, to detect how a process is operating. So, uh, but to understand how we got to where we are today, we're gonna go back to 2012. So uh, the internet of things has not lived up to the hype. Uh, and why we say that is back in 2012, the IBM Watson team uh, predicted that we'd have 1 trillion IoT devices out there in the world just by 2015, which would have been three years later. Uh, when we got to 2015, we were nowhere near that. And you can see all the future projections for how many IoT devices are coming in the future, always several years away, they keep falling lower and lower. Uh, and today there's you know, uh, under 20 billion IoT devices out there in the world. And only a fraction of that are industrial IoT devices, right? Uh, that, that go after the kinds of things that uh, people are typically inspecting manually and would really, really benefit um, from IoT sensing to bring those data streams in. Here at EverActive, we think there's two reasons for that. Uh, two reasons why we're not hitting these projected numbers. Uh, the first reason is batteries. You know, batteries, uh, logistically, it's just very difficult to stay on top of a fleet of aging batteries out there in the world. Uh, we've met a lot of maintenance planners in the world uh, and a lot of technicians, but we've never met somebody who's a battery changer or a battery changing scheduler. So if you're gonna adopt a fleet of battery powered sensors into your environment, you're taking those existing people and now adding a new task. Uh, those maintenance planners have to make sure they have all the batteries they need in stock and the people to go out there and change them. Uh, and you know, usually they're not considering that when they think about getting these new data streams. Uh, on the environmental side, you know, many of these batteries can be recycled, but if you think about having to just store the good batteries before you deploy them, uh, and then uh, take the bad batteries and warehouse them for some amount of time before you can take them to be properly disposed of, it's a big headache. I have a huge jar here that my wife fills with our dead batteries, and once a year or so I try to figure out what to do with them you know, find some place that will take them. If you think about thousands or tens of thousands of batteries in an industrial environment where you have to worry about keeping on top of that stock, it's a difficult thing to do. So instead of, um, 
you know, uh, disposing of them properly. Sometimes we see them thrown away, which is a really, really difficult uh, thing to wrap your head around there. But even if you had excellent batteries, a 10 year battery life, which we have never seen a product that lived up to a 10 year battery life uh, in an industrial sensing environment. But even if we were able to get 10 year batteries to hit that IBM Watson number, we'd need 274 million replacements of batteries every single day. Um, it's just, uh, it's a lot to stomach. So everybody wants all the good things that come with IoT solutions. The whole idea is to run more efficiently, uh, have better insight into your facility and not have to dedicate as much time to, to thinking about these things until they, they pop up and become a real issue. Uh, but if you add the human cost and the, the actual cost of buying those batteries, uh, it just means that we're getting fewer data points than we should. So uh, we see smaller deployments of sensors where people are picking the top five or 10% of their you know, assets and putting sensors on them. But the sensors themselves are also rationing out the data they send to try to milk as much life as possible out of those batteries. So instead of transmitting continuously, uh, which would cause them to run out of battery within you know, a couple weeks to a couple months, they're gonna transmit a couple times an hour or a couple times a day to try to live up to those battery projections. So to uh, drive the point home one more time here about the human capital involved, uh, a little projection. If you had a million data points coming in through battery powered sensors, uh, as those uh, you know, batteries aged out, you would need 120 full-time employees or full-time equivalent employees to go around just changing batteries, uh, which is a huge team. So that makes it pretty clear to me why people are not willing to scatter these things everywhere and subscribe to this new uh, lifetime of repeat battery replacement. So the other uh, thesis we have for not hitting those projected numbers uh, is the fragmentation of what's out there and the, you know, the integration of them into your environment. So for each one of these rows here, um, most solutions today have a different provider for each one. Uh, with our first product, Steam Trap Monitoring, we had a customer come to us who was looking at us and a competitor. And for each one of these rows uh, in their uh, RFP response, they had a different vendor show up under one umbrella for the bid. So they had four companies that they had to wrangle to get you know, the, the mounting to the asset, the sensor itself, uh, the connectivity in the plant, back all to the cloud, and then the analytics to make sense of that data. Uh, all from four different companies that would have to work together. And it, it turned this particular uh, maintenance professional into a project manager, just trying to figure out how to get these external vendors managed. So. But uh, we're not the only ones who've seen that example in our customers. Uh, Bain did a study on this. In 2016, they went to specifically to predictive maintenance professionals about industrial IoT and said, are you excited about this in 2016? And the enthusiasm was sky high, like 90% of people said, yeah, we wanna get industrial IoT sensors into our space to help with these maintenance issues. 2018, they went back and they re-polled the same people who responded to that survey. And the enthusiasm had dropped way down, like more than half, like 30% of people were excited about IoT for predictive maintenance. And so they commissioned a study that came out last year and they boiled down the reasons why these uh, people were not as enthusiastic anymore to these four core reasons. IT infrastructure is not ready <laughs> for this amount of data. Uh, the build it yourself method is uh, hard to do. Uh, there's no guarantee of success and it can cost a lot of money. If you grab things that are pre-built off the shelf and try to put them into a corporate or industrial environment uh, or a university, um, a government facility, you are opening up yourself to security exploits and flaws. And uh, most of these solutions don't have a connection to energy use or energy consumption and how to reduce it. So, you know, you get some kind of raw data without analysis as to what you should go fix to improve your operating conditions. So those all make sense to me. We've heard these uh, from our customers too. So enter Everactive, our company. Uh, we make sensors that sit out at the edge uh, on steam traps or pumps, fans, rotating and vibrating equipment. Today, we're looking at the machine health monitor. So there's a picture of a steam trap there, but we're not gonna spend too much time on that today. Uh, these sensors sit out at the, at the edge and they gather data continuously. So they're always on uh, and always measuring and then transmit back wirelessly. And they can do this perpetually with very low levels of harvested energy, like the amount of light in the room you're in right now uh, or a small difference in temperature. They're designed to be out in industrial environments so that IP66 rating is for water or dust ingress into the enclosure. They're fine to be outside. We have them in processed environments where they're getting hosed down uh, by customers today. Uh, so uh, we've seen um, in those environments, uh, you know, uh, caustic spray down, that sort of thing, sensors rated to handle that. Uh, and they're also intrinsically safe at a rating of class one division two. So if you have electrical classification in your facility, 
uh, to you know, uh, make sure you're explosion proof, our sensors are designed to um, work in those environments as well. I say wide operating range here. Uh, what I mean is a wide temperature operating range. You know, these uh, sensors can work everything from an outdoor process in the Midwest winter where we saw 40 below uh, up to summer in the south in a steam tunnel uh, where we've seen continuous operation at 160 degrees for that. So, so once those sensors uh, digitize, uh, you know, that, that process, they, they take measurements around those systems. They send them up to the cloud through a, a pretty traditional IoT gateway uh, where we think of them once they hit the cloud as new data streams. And the reason why we say that is if you were getting quarterly vibration analysis data before on a motor uh, and you install our sensor, which will report back every 15 seconds, in the first minute, you're going to get a year's worth of data. And in the first hour, you're going to have 60 years worth of vibration analysis data on that motor. So uh, that's a, a ton of data to wrap your head around, a huge data lake and a new data stream. But we do not expect you to parse all that yourself. It would be too much uh, for you to understand. Uh, so that's why we have uh, analytics and a notification engine where we can send you alerts when something moves out of spec. Uh, so your attention is called only to the things that need fixing. Uh, which means you're not going around, uh, you know, running predictive analysis uh, with handheld tools, visiting machines that most of the time are good. You know, uh, most of these um, manual audit rounds we see 90% plus uh, of the assets they're checking in on are, are behaving just fine. Uh, so in our view, that's wasted steps to go and visit all those things uh, to check on them and only see that they're good. Uh, with continuous sensing, you can take that same person and redirect them to only things that are failed. Uh, and they'll never check on a good one again. Uh, but we don't just use um, alerts to do that. Uh, you know, today we're doing that with text messaging and email, uh, but we can also use cross-platform APIs to get into our customer systems too. So later this year, we'll be able to integrate this product into work order systems, uh, which could tip you off, uh, you know, your staff off uh, to go check on a, an asset uh, without even having to acknowledge it in email. One thing we should note about these solutions, you know, everything from the low power chips that uh, allow our sensors to be batteryless, all the way up to the web UI and the analytics are all done by EverActive employees, uh, which means you, know, you don't have to bring separate integrators together. Uh, we can design, prototype, support, troubleshoot these things all in house. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that integrator issue or getting uh, stuck in as, you know, with one of your support people being a middleman. Uh, we can call our VP of software right now. Our help desk has his phone number. Uh, so there's nothing uh, we can encounter here in, in the commissioning of this system that we can't help uh, with. Uh, all without ever changing a battery. So let's talk a little bit about that uh, next, batteryless operation. Our core te technology, you know, our, our intellectual property that's really our differentiator is this batteryless technology. Uh, we were uh, spun out of university research. Our co-founders met at MIT and went back to their home universities, University of Michigan and the University of Virginia. One of them with a specialty in low power radios and the other with a specialty in super low power processing. When you bring those things together, uh, you can build these smart sensors that sit out at the edge and can run off of a, a very small amount of temperature differential with a thermoelectric generator. That's what's down here in the lower left hand corner. Uh, indoor, outdoor solar light, uh, radio frequencies, or vibration. In the case of the applications we're doing today, uh, temperature differential and light have been so plentiful, we haven't needed to productize radio frequency or vibration. So in the case of this product, the machine health monitor, it can use either of these two, indoor or outdoor light, uh, or a temperature differential to power itself in perpetuity. We provide everything you need to get up and running in these solutions. So we have some sensors here on the left-hand side, photos of those, and then in the middle is one of our IoT gateways. This is a very standard kind of you know, industrial PC in a box. Uh, it's also waterproof and rated for extreme conditions you know, in temperature spray down. Uh, we have an intrinsically safe model as well. It's, uh, this one pictured here is about the size of a shoebox. Uh, so we place these around the facility. Uh, and then they uh, transmit directly over LTE to the cloud where you can access the results of that sensor data and our analytics uh, on cross-platform software. And it's truly universal. You do not need to install an app. Everything is driven through a web browser. Uh, the notifications come via email or text. So you, know, you don't have to um, install a special app on your computer or commission a server on your site in order to use our technology. It's completely freestanding. Uh, as I talked about earlier, we are working on integrations into other platforms as well. Uh, so we can take data up and out from there, uh, but you don't need to bring anything to get started. Just bring your motors or your steam traps. So for our customers, this means right out of the box, they have a solution that they know is gonna work. You take sensors out, you take the gateway out, uh, you apply those assets to the, the motor, 
and within a, a few minutes, really, you're seeing data flowing to the cloud. You haven't added the maintenance problem of dealing with batteries. Uh, you're not gonna go back and visit those assets until you know something's wrong with them. Uh, so you're not gonna make this trip just to check on a battery or replace a battery uh, when there's nothing wrong with the underlying motor. And finally, uh, with our web dashboard, you know, we're able to call attention to things that need fixing. So it's very clear uh, to see you know, how we've added value in your environment uh, by showing you those faults that we've detected uh, and displaying them in a, a linear straightforward way. So uh, next, let's take a closer look at the machine health monitor itself. Um, this is uh, the moment I've been waiting for. I'm sure some of you have too, uh, especially if you've heard of our company before. Uh, here's an example of an install uh, out in one of our beta install environments. You can see here our Ever sensor uh, sitting up uh, on the motor, uh, a thermoelectric generator and a photovoltaic solar harvester. You can take a closer look at each individual component here, but uh, this is designed to fit motors of all sizes from you know small, sub horsepower motors, 200 plus, 300 plus horsepower motors. That's kind of the way we see these sensors being most valuable to be deployed at. The Ever sensor itself is, is small. Like I said, it would fit in the palm of your hand. I'll show you one here live in a moment. Uh, this is what transmits data back to your gateway. Uh, it does have a super capacitor on it for some energy storage. Uh, we can use a uh, magnet, uh, screw mounts, or um, uh, you know, kind of perch mounts on, on the, the motor, stud mounts. Uh, or epoxy mounts for that. Um, this unit is, is smart. It has a processor in it and can generate a fast Fourier transform right there on the unit at the edge. That's what's transmitted back to the gateway. Uh, and that's water and dust tight to our IP66 rating. So this little sensor is capable of perpetual transmission every 15 seconds back to the gateway at just a 15 degree difference in temperature uh, from the skin temp of the motor. So if it feels warm to you, uh, that's more than enough for us to transmit. Pretty remarkable little device. Inside, uh, there's a triaxial accelerometer. Uh, we have a magnet sensor that helps us measure the cycles per minute or uh, calculate VFD slip if the uh, motor is not running at the rate you think it should. Uh, it also takes an ambient temperature measurement, an ambient relative humidity measurement. Uh, but what's really neat about this to me versus our, our previous product is that it's capable of uh, taking over the updates. So we can update the software on this remotely, change parameters on it remotely. Once it's placed in location, you wouldn't have to go back and, and make any changes in it, even if you wanted to alter the software settings. So pretty cool development in our new radio protocol that we're able to do that. So taking a closer look at our thermoelectric generator. Uh, these are magnetic, but they can also be epoxied down. Just find a warm spot on the motor. Uh, if it feels warm to the touch on your hand, that's probably more than enough for us to power. It's that temperature differential that generates the power. So in the core of this is something called a Peltier device. Uh, we did not invent that. Um, you know, that's a technology that's been around a while. What's really remarkable about us is that we can use such a small harvester uh, and still power our sensors. So uh, it's inside that Peltier device are uh, two dissimilar pieces of metal. If one is warmer than the other, then it starts to emit a trace amount of current. Um, that's what those blue fins are for. That heat sink allows us to exaggerate that temperature differential from the skin temp of the motor and the air there. Uh, so that's what gets the electricity flowing uh, right there. It, it's wired back to our Ever sensor. Um, and you can actually place this anywhere on the motor body or driven equipment. It could even go on a neighboring machine uh, if you needed to. Uh, but it does track the temperature where you spot it. So if you put it on somewhere where you want a temperature measurement, uh, that'll be reported as well. Another view of our thermoelectric generator here. Uh, neat thing about this, it does daisy chain out to that solar harvester. Uh, so you can add an additional um, harvester there. That's new for this product and platform for us. Um, the solar harvester comes in uh, two different form factors there for indoor or outdoor light. It's used in conjunction with the thermoelectric generator. It could run on as little as 200 lux, which is really dim. Um, lux is a measurement of light and, and 200 lux is almost certainly the amount of light in the room you're in now, uh, even if the lights are off. It's probably uh, light enough for us to power this sensor. Uh, but we have outdoor light uh, modules available too, and essentially any amount of outdoor light will power this sensor in perpetuity. With outdoor light, you get IR for red light, and it's a much more plentiful source of energy for us. Uh, so yeah, that solar harvester, really handy, uh, new way to power one of our sensors. Super excited to see these getting out into the world. So we started with a, a photo of a big motor, big, big install motor. Here's a smaller one just to give you an idea of the size. Uh, complete install there with the, the sensor, thermoelectric generator, and our solar harvester. So 
so our target for this is kind of the balance of plant. And what we mean by that is if you have a thousand horsepower motor, it probably came with a suite of built-in analytics, you know, uh, onboard sensing. And you, you probably um, already have somebody looking into that data regularly. But there's a just a huge number of motors, the, a big percentage of the motors in your plants today or in your facilities uh, that have been deemed maybe, you know, not worth putting expensive instrumentation on in order to understand how they're behaving. And we hope we can break through that. Uh, this will retrofit to you know pretty much any existing motor. As I said, if it's not a magnetic motor, we can epoxy down the mounts. Uh, small and large motors, you know, both uh, we can measure. And the idea here is to help you understand sooner when they're in danger of failing, so they can go be serviced. So. Um, uh, we collect your vibration levels. Uh, in as I said, it's a triaxial accelerometer, so three axis. Um, we are going to give you in the software side the magnitudes of those nine highest peaks, uh, an interpretation of the VFD output from that magnetic sensor, uh, the surface temperature of the motor, ambient temperature in the air, uh, and we are working on calculating machine runtime and starts and stops as well in our software. So uh, what I'm really excited about on this slide is this data transmission. If you've seen our previous product with our Gen 1 radio, uh, the range on this one, 800 foot, is a, a big leap ahead. Um, so we design all of our sensors to fit in industrial environments. In fact, I, I talked to our lead RF engineer about, you know, what he had in mind when he designed the protocol. And he said um, to think of the Windows pipe screensaver. I might be dating myself a little bit there, but think about that, that dense environment where there's, you know, just kind of a, a jungle of pipes in your way. Uh, so all of our testing is done in industrial environments where it's dense. We know we're not going to get a line of sight. So that NLOS is non-line of sight. Uh, we also support on all of our products tremendous density sensor and gateway. Uh, so we've tested, you know, a thousand plus sensors reporting to a gateway, a single gateway, no problem. Uh, and from that gateway, you can use LTE, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet uh, to get that data up to the cloud. Once it hits the cloud, you can, you know, mouse through all of that data at any time. Uh, we have threshold alarms that we can configure for those parameters and then send you an email um, you can jump right into the dashboard from there and we'll escalate the ones that we think need the most attention. Uh, and it's really just simple, straightforward, and easy to get going. You know, you can edit the metadata for the sensors right there on the cloud uh, to pull it up and have it match your facility. Straightforward, uh, you know, really uh, kind of linear, easy to, easy to grasp. So. All right, so next on our agenda here, I, I want to show you the hardware. So I'm going to stop screen sharing for a moment. And we're going to toggle over to our camera. So here in the room with me, I have a small motor. It's like a seven and a half horsepower motor. I put the can of Coke there just kind of as, as a reference point. So you get a sense of the scale, both of the motor and of our sensor itself. Tom and I were talking earlier about this motor. It's an old marathon electric industrial motor. Let's pull out a salvage uh, in a factory here in Detroit. And Tom was saying, you know, I, I asked him, what the, what's a typical application for a motor like this? And he said, there's dozens to hundreds of potential applications for a motor like this. So probably see a lot of them that look like this in your facility. So starting off, I just wanted to talk about our mount. So the mount itself here is a, a small, you know, about two by two inch cube um, that you can epoxy down or magnet down. You can also see in the middle there, there's a hole for that stud mount. Uh, so anywhere to you know, find a, a spot along the, the rotor here, it could be you know, along the side, but typically uh, customers are taking their pre-existing measurements at top dead center. So we'll put that there. This is the sensor itself, brains of the outfit. So it has all of our uh, low power chips in there uh, for the radio transmission, the processing, creating that FFT. There's a little window on the front. Um, you can see there's a Gore-Tex logo on there because that's how we uh, can insulate waterproof the sensor and still get a, a ambient humidity and temperature readings. Uh, and it's made to mate into this base. We'll work on a couple other different bases too that could get you a standoff from the motor. And this is the one that we're shipping on day one. So put that into there and then it screws down. And you just place that on the motor body. This one has kind of a satisfying magnetic lock going on, but once again, there's a, a host of different ways that you can mount those. Uh, next, our thermoelectric generator. So this contains that Peltier device I talked about. You know, essentially from the base here, uh, which will apply to the surface of the motor to the tip of these fins, if we have like a 15 degree Fahrenheit temperature differential, that's enough for us to power the sensor. Uh, so that's our thermoelectric generator. If you've seen our previous product, we used to have one, that, uh, we still have one actually that mates to a pipe uh, for steam applications, but uh, this one was redesigned in order to mate to motors. So we have some arms here that'll uh, help our peg from drifting once we're applied. 
So we have little stability arms we can bend out of this. I found a spot on the motor. I'm gonna put it right here over the bearing because that's a spot I'd like to monitor the temperature on. The connector between the sensor uh, and our harvesters is a USB-C type connector. Uh, we've keyed them uh, so they fit in properly and can be screwed in. There's also a waterproof gasket around it. So this means that the cable won't be pulled out once you've screwed it in. You know it's going to be in there tight and you know it's going to be waterproof. Last of all, we have one of our solar harvesters here for the daisy chain. So a small solar cell. It's funny, when I think about solar cells, like if you go to Harbor Freight or if you drive down the side of the highway, you're used to seeing these huge solar cells like you know, the size of your car, just the power of a roadside light or a, a, a sign, you know, that kind of thing. So to be able to use a, a really small, discrete harvester like this, it's a breakthrough for us. For both of these harvesters, you know, if you tried to power something like my Apple Watch, it would not even boot uh, because the Apple Watch has four very power hungry things in it. The top four energy consumers in there are LTE, Wi-Fi, the screen, and Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is kind of the most humble of those. Uh, at 50 microwatts. Uh, our wake-up radio is at um, 200 nanowatts, so it's an order of magnitude lower. Uh, we have individual components uh, we're working on that operate in the picowatts, so when you think about just that small amount of energy, uh, that's really what allows us to be different from our competitors. So we're going to screw this in with the same connector there, a waterproof gasket, threaded USB-C connection, and we just find a spot where we got you know, our best access to light, I'll pop it up here for now. That's also magnetic, so get in position and, and there you go. Simple install. In the amount of time I've been talking, if we had warm motor uh, or, you know, if we had uh, light, uh, we'd already be up and communicating to our game. Or... My slide deck here. So that's the hardware side uh, of the solution. Uh, next up, we have our software. Uh, we've built this you know, from the ground up once again to uh, call your attention to the things that are most important. Uh, so each time we install one of those motors, we'll, uh, those motor monitors, we'll gather information off the nameplate of the motor that we'll put into the cloud. That'll help inform our analytics uh, as well as just making it you know, easy for you to understand which motor we're talking about when calling it. So. Uh, here's an example of our vibration level measurement in velocity. We're going to measure here IPS peak. And for each, each little spot on this graph is an individual measurement in time. So you can drag your mouse across them, highlight them, and see them, uh, compare them to one another. Neat thing about our cloud platform is you can go back and see all these measurements you know, uh, at any time. You can go back and see the history of this motor. So uh, you could call up you know, measurements that are months or even years old. Uh, in order to see if the data we're looking at today uh, in, in context, if it makes sense or not, you know, if it's a radical derivation from expected behavior. So that chart level view is where a lot of our customers start, you know, looking for a peak or something that's off. Uh, but we also have a waterfall view of our FFTs. So uh, this is a three-dimensional graph, uh, which allows us to, you know, uh, use this waterfall plot to look for things that might look a little bit off. We see a couple things here that may be noise. Uh, maybe another outlier here. It's a sample data. So basically, yours would look a little bit different depending on your application and your environment. Um, we can also zoom down to ranges inside uh, this measurement if we wanted to take a look at a specific part of the data. Uh, so it just gives you a quick way to understand, you know, why you got an alert and what you should look for when you go and check on the motor. So in the uh, case of our thresholding, uh, for you know, all of our parameters that we measure, we can set thresholds around those. Obviously, vibration level is the one that most of our customers are, are interested in. Uh, so we can set vibration levels there uh, and then get a notification that's per asset. You know, Tom and I were talking about these thresholds and how you know, they're not typically one size fits all. You can't apply a general rule to all these. Tom, I think you were telling me a story about you know, what happens when you get trained in vibration analysis. Yeah, Peter, the old rule of thumb is that you take your first round of readings uh, coming back from your first training class. And if you applied the broad brush uh, recommended alert and alarm settings, you'd end up shutting down half your plant. Um, something I think <laughs> that many of us have learned the hard way. Yeah, it's funny to think about, right? Like the textbook says it one way, but then when you get there and you're into actual making and you've applied it, it might operate a little bit different. So, you know, we do not try to, uh, you know, 
uh, assume that a universal alert threshold is going to work for everybody, we can change that to fit your environment. Good to know. All right, uh, so uh, our, this product is set to be released commercially in July. Uh, we do have some pre-release customers who are using the sensors today, so we've been able to be out there in the world gathering data on them. Uh, and so we can speak to these specifications as being valid. Uh, it's just that uh, you know we're, uh, our official commercial release is coming next month. So we're accepting customers today uh, to, to sign up and, and look at applications in their environments, and we'll be shipping them out the door in July. Uh, I talked a little bit about that thermoelectric generator that you know, 15 degree temperature differential, so small between the motor surface and, and ambient. Uh, but you can also, in combination with the tag, use solar. Uh, so if you have light, that'll help uh, as well, power the sensor. Uh, we've talked about EMF, electromagnetic field harvesting. And frankly, in all the applications we've looked at so far, we've been fine with either temperature or solar. Uh, but EMF is on our roadmap. So later this year or next year, you may see EMF harvesting uh, join the fray as another way for us to power our sensors. So. Um, our default interval for transmission, you know, is 60 seconds on these, but we are testing them down to every 15 seconds uh, for applications where that's necessary. Um, that's, you know, for those vibration levels for each of those three axes, uh, the temperature readings, uh, both the ambient and the skin of the machine, and VFD output. Um, in the case of the runtime and the stop-start counter, uh, that'll be coming later this year. One really neat thing about this platform is since we can make software updates both to the cloud and to the sensor itself uh, over the air. We do not need uh, to be locked into a software feature set when we ship. We'll be able to introduce additional features after the product's already out there in the world. So you could buy one in July. Uh, and as we continue to evolve the software for those new features, uh, you'll be able to get those automatically applied uh, via over the air updates. So. The sensors themselves can also report their stored power level and their signal strength, which can help us in troubleshooting. You know, if there's an obstruction, uh, we can see that maybe they're on the fringe or have a weak signal. But uh, range has become much less of a problem for us since developing our new radio standard. So Evernet 2, uh, this will be the first product we ship with that. Uh, we're seeing an 800 foot range in industrial environments. Uh, we're standards compliant. So we have our FCC IDs for this uh, in the sub gigahertz range. Super low power with great range, which are two things that are usually at odds with one another. And uh, that over air configurability new for us uh, with this product at the sensor level. Uh, the gateways themselves haven't changed a whole lot uh, other than having our new generation radio in them. Uh, they still support LTE, Wi-Fi, or Ethernet uh, to back all up to the cloud. And we can use AC mains, you know, like a traditional wall transformer uh, or power over Ethernet in order to run those gateways. So that's what uh, most of our customers are doing today. On the cloud side, uh, we continue to advance the cloud product. Uh, so we'll be able to do complete pairing and provisioning from the cloud side when this product's released, which is new for us. Um, so if, you, if you've added new sensors, it'll be easy and simple for you to drive through our web interface. Uh, we'll get early warning notifications for you uh, that are reviewed both by our analytics, but also vibration analysts. And we have you know, PDM experts in-house that are looking at these alerts uh, who can help you put them in context. Obviously, we're also getting threshold alerts uh, that are user configurable that can come in the EverCloud dashboard, the email or SMS. Uh, later this year, updates to the cloud will give us uh, data analysis to do deeper things like alarming on the rate of change or a standard deviation change from our mean uh, for measured parameters. So another example of something that um, uh, we hope to have in, in day one, but we can still add later this year uh, via over the year updates. We're also working on machine learning and deep learning analytics around those assets uh, to give you greater insight as to how they're behaving. And finally, uh, we're working on a calculator to give you, you know, kind of business impact analysis about the downtime and electrical consumption of these aging motors. You know, there's a thesis we're after there that uh, there's a time in a motor's life as it ages and becomes less efficient, uh, where instead of running it to failure from an electrical consumption standpoint, it's cheaper uh, and makes more sense to just replace it outright uh, or service it. Uh, so that's what we're after with those analytics, and, and those are something we're continuing to work on. You saw the physical install just now. Uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward to get going. Uh, applies pretty easily to motors, pumps, fans, gearboxes, really any rotating and vibrating equipment um, you know, that, that you would like to have notifications from, we can censor up. Uh, and you know, right out of the box, it, usually these things go on in under five minutes. So the magnetic mount's the easiest way to get going, but we also can do stud mounts if you need to get up and away from the motor body a little bit, or you can epoxy it down 
uh, if you have a, you know, a high vibration environment where you think the magnet could walk. And from the time we ship these, they'll be IP66 and electrically classified. All right, so let's talk about next steps, what this looks like in your environment. The first objection as to why we're not seeing more predictive maintenance devices, uh, IoT devices out there in the world, that IT is not scalable. I think that's still true in a lot of these environments. Luckily, Evernet uh, supports thousands of sensors. Uh, we're putting just a handful of gateways. You could do over a thousand sensors on a single gateway. Uh, most of our integrations out there in the world today don't require a single network connection, and none of our pre-release customers uh, for this product have used in-house networking connections. So all of our uh, pre-release customers have been able to use LTE uh, to get this information up to the cloud. This build-it-yourself method where you're the integrator is difficult, expensive, and risky. So our sensors are made to retrofit to equipment just like yours uh, without having to turn anything off. You don't have to buy a smart motor. You don't have to stop your process. You know, most of these applications go on in a couple minutes. Uh, there are not big upfront capital expenses to get started. We're service-based. So um, you pay a, a flat service fee, and uh, that is you know, simple and easy to calculate for us to quote ahead of time. Uh, and that way you're not stuck you know, buying into this huge platform and then waiting for years for it to pay off. Um, you'll know right away if you're getting returns or not. And, and since we are a service, we've really de-risked it for you. If you do find for some reason that you know, monitoring these machines is not providing value to you, you can turn the service off and we have to come and get our ball and go home. So that third objection uh, that attempting to integrate off the shelf devices introduces security flaws, that's true. Anybody who has like a ring doorbell can tell you, you know, those files go up to Amazon and, and who knows what happens from there. Uh, our EverActive products adhere to really strict security standards uh, for both hardware and software encryption. Uh, our solutions are already trusted by, you know, manufacturers, government agencies here in the U.S. and big universities. So we've had to pass a bunch of very stringent uh, security audits. In fact, we have uh, self-imposed SOC 2 auditing to our company. Uh, so that level, that SOC 2 level, of a data audit uh, means that we are per perpetually being audited to make sure we're uh, being in a sanitary in our data handling and not introducing security issues into our environment or our customer environments. That SOC 2 audit standard is the same standard that the government uses for their NIST NIST standards. Uh, so that is the, the standard for data security in private industry. Uh, last of all here, most IoT solutions don't have a, a clear connection to energy consumption. You know, they give you a, a temperature measurement or they, they give you one piece of data, uh, but they don't have a, a, a translation as to where you need to go in your facility to go fix it or reduce this energy consumption. EverCloud has a summary rundown of alarm parameters, so it'll call your attention to machines that are, you know, operating over your thresholds and that are furthest away from optimal, so you can figure out which machines are wasteful and need attention. So when we think about our network architecture, you know, we roll sensors out in the world, these ever sensors, uh, and the idea is to get, you know, many of them out there pervasively sensing your environment to cut down on these manual rounds that you're doing on foot. Uh, that low power Evernet uh, reports back to our gateways. And once the gateways are in and we establish this network of sending data up to the cloud, um, you know, you may start today with something like steam traps or motors, and then you'll have a, a single dashboard that reports, you know, all that, that data out. So as we work on future products, the machine health monitor, which is coming now, or like pressure safety valves, which are another application we're looking at, if you've already got the gateways established and you've blanketed your facility in Evernet, uh, trying new products and adding them in is it's simple. Uh, you just pop them on and get started with it, uh, those simple retrofit installs like the one we looked at. So when we look at our short-term roadmap, a lot of people ask what's next. And uh, we are very application focused. We try to think about things that we know are wasteful, uh, know are causing you know, operations issues, uptime issues in our customer environments. So we started with steam traps. From there, we knew we need to measure temperatures, remote temperatures around the trap, ambient temperatures. We also get humidity and lux. So these top four sensors with a thermoelectric generator for the hot pipe, that's our steam trap monitor. For vibrating equipment, uh, we're using ambient remote temperature measurements, humidity and lux. In addition, we have the three axis accelerometer and that magnetometer to give us a sense of VFD slip. Uh, all six of those sensors are in a single package that can use either thermoelectric or photovoltaic uh, to power itself. Uh, so if you start thinking about future applications for us, we think about what sensors we can support and how we're gonna power those applications. 
So uh, we've already in the lab tested pressure, acoustics, ultrasound, and gas detection, and we've been able to power those for some amount of time off of our harvested energy budget, transmit data back. So we're working on productizing those into other things that you may see around your facility uh, that could benefit from pervasive sensing where you don't want to have to go and change a battery. Um, EMF and vibration are also on our roadmap for harvesting. A lot of people think, hey, if we know we have a vibrating machine, why don't we use vibration as our primary harvester? And uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. The reason why we don't is uh, for harvesting from vibration, you have to tune the crystal to a very specific range of vibration. And as motors age, even before they go out of parameter, uh, they may change that, uh, the harmonic they're vibrating at, which means you could walk away from what it takes to power the sensor while the machine is still operating within specified parameters. So we're continuing to do research about, around that. There may be other applications where that makes sense. But for all the applications uh, we've seen so far in our pre-release, we've been able to power them off of temperature differential or a solar cell. Uh, finally here, uh, we are still accepting feedback about this uh, solution. As I said, it's malleable. Even once the hardware is deployed, we can continue to add features via software. Uh, so that's something we're working on. This giant QR code on the right-hand side of your screen, if you hold your phone up and open your camera app, you'll be able to scan it and it'll take you to a survey uh, where we'd love to get your feedback about what you've seen today and uh, ways you could improve, uh, we could improve the product. If there are must-haves in there for you, we'd love to hear them. Um, obviously, we'll take a few questions today as well. So if you take a look at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a Q&A box. Tom and I will take a look through those together here and I'll, uh, I'll read a few of those out. And we can see, um, see what folks are interested in talking about here. All right, we'll do our Q&A. Tom, I feel like that was a whirlwind, you know? It kind of went around the world and back. Okay, first question. Do you make your own tags or do you simply source them? Great question. We source them. Uh, we wrap the mechanical engineering around them to make them work, but the actual core itself, the Peltier device, those two dissimilar pieces of metal, that's, you know, kind of a commodity. That's out there and, and can be had. So we take uh, tags that we buy from a supplier and wrap them inside a little mechanical engineering in order to get them to work. Okay, uh, what does low levels of harvested energy mean exactly? I mean, this was early in the, uh, in the um, presentation. I think we've talked about what we mean by low levels of harvested energy. So just a low level of solar light, like a dim indoor lighting, 200 lux. And actually there are apps on your smartphone where you can measure lux using the built-in cameras. So if you ha have questions about what exactly that means, um, you know, we, we can, talk you through what 200 lux looks like. Uh, but in the case of temperature differential, uh, you know, that's a, a change in uh, difference between the air and the thing that our, our tag is on. And that starts at 15 degrees Fahrenheit or above is enough for us. What is an FFT and why should I care? Tom, will you talk through fast Fourier transforms and, and how we convert data from our accelerometer? Yep, uh, happy to do that, Peter. I think anybody that's been uh, exposed to vibration analysis would understand FFT. It stands for Fast Fourier Transform. It is a series of calculations that takes a complex wave that's not truly a sine wave and breaks down the individual frequencies of vibration and the magnitudes of vibration, and that really helps you zero in on what the cause of the high vibration is, and therefore what maintenance steps should be taken to correct it. Cool, that makes good sense. Uh, next question, is the solar harvester optional or required? Solar is optional. Uh, we can power off of a temperature differential alone. Um, you can put it downstream from the tag, uh, but if you don't need it, uh, you don't have to take it. Uh, another question, uh, the cable between the sensor and the tag is pretty short. Do you have other sizes? Yes, great question. We have all kinds of sizes we can ship out for these. I think one of the advantages of having, you know, these components be modular and not hardwired to one another is that you can, uh, you know, build it kind of suit to fit. So uh, we start every integration now with a walkthrough, you know, talking to our customers about where they'd like to place the sensors, uh, where they'd like to place the harvesters. And if we need longer throws of cabling in order to permit that, we can do that. You know, we've seen a few examples already where um, you know, only part of the, the application had uh, light shining down on it, or only part of it was warm, like the driven equipment was warm, but the motor was not. Uh, so using longer cable lengths uh, to extend off of the sensor allows us to uh, still power ourselves even in environments like that. Okay. 
uh, can you elaborate about cost effectiveness ROI? Uh, yeah, so we, you know, we, we take a look at um, for our applications, how we can pay off uh, by looking at, you know, where you're being wasteful today in energy consumption and also where you're being wasteful in manpower, right? If you think about the cost of uh, doing routine manual audits on all these motors uh, by uh, taking those people and redirecting them to only things that need to be fixed, you're gonna run much more efficiently. Uh, so we are working on some ROI calculators about um, you know, implementing our product and what that means for savings at the facility level. I'm happy to sync up with you uh, after the meeting. We can talk about what those models look like. Is the solar harvester shockproof? Is it protected against physical damage due to debris? Uh, it is. There's, there's a rubberized casing around it, uh, and it's pretty tough. Uh, obviously, we have a vibration spec for it, and I can run that down for you. It's on our spec sheet. Um, but yes, uh, you know, it, it won't be shaken to death by the motor for sure. Uh, obviously, if there's impact damage to it, like if you, you know, you drop a hammer on it, it could break. But one of the benefits of us being a service model is, you know, we cover our hardware. So uh, we'll be happy to work with you on uh, replacement parts if you have something like a, a failed unit due to impact damage. First couple times it happens, it's on us. If you start shipping them back to us with boot prints and tire marks on them, you may talk about what we can do to make sure they're better protected. Uh, do we use a piezoelectric crystal for measuring? No, we do not use piezoelectrics for measuring. Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. I think we're just using a, a three-axis accelerometer for measurements today on vibration analysis and a, a, a magnetic sensor and magnetometer for uh, the VFD measurements. The accelerometers are piezoelectric based, but they are digital accelerometers. I see another question about um, accelerometer sensitivity being typically 100 millivolts per G. Again, um, we use a digital accelerometer, triaxulose P there, the calibration. Oops, Alan, I, I lost your audio for just a moment there. Um, digital accelerometer, I got that for sure. Uh, if you wouldn't mind repeating yourself. Okay, Tom's audio banding out a little on me here. Can you <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to jump to the next question, Tom. We'll circle back around for your answer. Just... All right. Okay. I'm having a few audio issues there. Um, I'm going to jump over to our next question. Not sure if you covered this already, but how are the sensors connected to the edge gateway? Yeah, so we use a proprietary low power radio standard to do that uh, because our uh, the protocols that were out in the world before we designed our products are just too power hungry. So if you were trying to, for example, use a harvested energy budget to transmit uh, via LTE, uh, you'd only be able to transmit, you know, maybe once a month or something along those lines, just because it requires so much energy to do. Uh, so from the uh, gateway out to the edge sensor, that is, uh, proprietary, super low power with great range, like I said, up to 800 feet uh, off of just using our, our energy harvesters. Uh, can you set a threshold based off FFT? Yes, you can. I showed a screenshot on that and um, we can set thresholds for uh, FFT values. Uh, so you can figure out if your overall energy uh, vibration level is too high, you can get a notification based off that. And that can be configured uh, per asset uh, per parameter. So if, if you have, you know, two motors right next to one another and one you want your axial vibration uh, setting to be different than the one next to it, uh, we can be that specific in setting our thresholds. All right. Uh, how does customer decide the threshold? How can you support? Uh, so we work together at the time of install to set some ground rules for thresholds. Uh, so if you don't know where to get started, we're happy to do that. Obviously, since there's uh, notifications involved, we want to make sure that we're um, choosing reasonable thresholds so you don't get too many notifications early in an integration. Uh, but our team, obviously, we have people who will be on site with you to help you get installed. And we have a team of uh, PDM experts uh, with deep experience in vibration analysis that can help you come up with reasonable thresholds to set when you're getting started. After you've gathered data, you know, after you've had the, uh, the accelerometer data out there, uh, for some period of time, you can always reevaluate and say, all right, this is where I've seen it operating in, in my application. And then uh, we can make changes as we see fit. Those are editable at all times. So if you have a motor that's too chatty, you know it's running okay, but the threshold was set too low, you can go and update that yourself anytime. 
All right. Some more questions around uh, price. Um, I will happy to sync up with you outside of here so we can talk a little bit what it looks like at your facility. But essentially, we uh, price you know per asset. So um, you know we'll look at the cost of sensoring up your motor. We'll determine how many accelerometers we need, how many measurement points we need, and then there'll be a monthly or annual fee involved in that. Uh, and we'll extrapolate that out to your facility. Okay. Whew, man, lots of questions here running down. Some of them are probably more Tom specific. Um, so uh, with Tom's audio off at the moment, there are a few of these that are specific about frequencies in the spectrum range. Uh, I'm gonna have uh, Tom speak to those and we will sync up with you out, uh, outside of the meeting on that. Uh, questions about load and shaft deflection. I will sync up with you on that one outside. What plans and timeframe are you looking at to distribute into Australia? Uh, so we are, our radios can be tuned to fit international spec standards. Uh, so we will sync up with you about that outside of the meeting as well. Um, but we are currently testing in countries outside of the US. It's just a matter of getting those certifications in order. Uh, so I, I can talk to our partnerships team and see if they've uh, started work already on Australia certifications. I don't know off the top of my head, but there are a number of countries outside of the US where we've already started the process of getting those certifications. So it may be uh, later, as soon as later this year, uh, just depending on all, all the hoops that are involved, you know, that we have to jump through in order to get the equivalent of an FCC certification out there. All right, well, uh, we wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to join us here today. Um, for the questions that we weren't able to get to in the group q and I'm gonna make sure we sync up together uh, outside. We have your names here uh, on that list in the Q&A and we'll reach out to you individually to make sure your questions get answered. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for making the time to be with us today. Super excited to introduce this product to you and looking forward to getting out into your environments and, and putting these on your motors and, and getting that data gathered. I think it's going to be really fun uh, to see this technology kind of uh, take flight here into the world. So thanks again for being a part of it with us today.